Good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is a nice, cozy setting. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, as I was gathering my thoughts for this afternoon, I was really thinking a lot about who I'm talking to and the fact that you all in this room are not the future of the party, but the present of the party. Uh, and I think that often we don't realize that. We don't acknowledge that and we don't invest in that. And so I'm glad that you all have taken the initiative to, for us to have a conversation this afternoon about some of the very important things that we are dealing with. This is going to be a conversation uh, and I'm glad that I prepared for it in this way because uh, it does feel very close and intimate. So over the last, I would say six months in particular, I've been reflecting a lot on the fact that we are really at the place for new governance in Barbados. We are really at the place and at the time and in the moment for a new governance in Barbados. And I'm gonna say a little this afternoon about what I mean by that. But I wanna start by reflecting again on, you know, when you study economics at school, at university, one of the most important disciplines that you take is in the area of political economy. And political economy is based on the notion that governments, that policy makers, that political actors make policy decisions that benefit their own political longevity. So that policy makers make decisions so that they get reelected or so that they get elected. So there's a concern that policy decisions are often made based not just on what is good or right for the population, not just on what is good or right for different groups in the population, but on what will get political actors re-elected or newly elected. And there's a whole discipline on that. In many ways, it is seen as something to cure. It is seen as a bad thing. In other words, how do we get policymakers and politicians to act based less on their own self-interest and more in the interest of the public? And their entire schools at universities, their lots and lots of courses that are just about that thing and is seen as something is a problem to solve. Especially when policy decisions are necessary that may make a policymaker or a politician politically unpopular, but are economically sound and socially just. And I want you to remember this as I speak this afternoon. Economists and public policy experts see this as the perfect state. Politicians who face problems and fix them in their own political term, rather than leaving them for others to inherit rather than leaving them for others who are likely also going to defer any real decision. While decade after decade, things get worse and worse, and ultimately the public is the one that pays the price. So for those who are economists and policymakers outside government at universities and so on, they feel that the, the ideal scenario is one in which policymakers and politicians do not act in a way to get them re-elected. And that ideally, that they act only in a way that is in the interest of the public. And I want us to reflect on that this afternoon because I want us to think about the government that we have. I really want us to think about what we have said that we've wanted and what we have today. So in May 2018, when we came to service as a government, we met, and I remember it very well, because after all of the pomp and circumstance and all of the swearing in and all of that, others may have gone home, but I didn't go home. Um, we had to go straight to start work. And after having met internally as an economic team, we had to have, everybody remembers, a very important meeting with the social partnership. And in that meeting, the Prime Minister asked a very important question, a very important series of questions. She asked that we agree on what was important to us as 
groups in this country as private sector, as, as, as trade union movement, as government, as individuals, that we agree on whether we thought that saving the dollar was important, saving the currency peg, whether we thought that there was need for reform in certain government departments and what that would entail, and whether we thought that there was need for very important reform in state-owned enterprises and what that would entail. And that, for me, was a very important step to take. Because when I think about a new gov governance, I think that we have to come to the place where we agree, we make a social compact. What is it that we want to happen in this country? And therefore, what are some of the sacrifices that collectively some of us may have to make and some of us more than others? Now that process when we met with the social partnership in 2018, it signaled for me, and I'm talking to you this afternoon as Marsha Cattle, as someone who has been in this political service for six years, having come to service officially in 2018. I'm reflecting this afternoon from that perspective because I think, I was saying to somebody the other day that some people think that politicians born big, right? We come to this work with values and with ideals and with things that we want to get done on behalf of the people that we grew up next to in our communities. That's, that's what we come for. Well, that's what I've come for. That's what Corey and Davidson and, and many of you and, and all of you, I hope, have come for. Um, but that process signaled for me the beginning of a new governance in Barbados and a new politics. It's the one that I bought into and that I supported and that I support. And it is apt that I'm talking with the young Barbados Labour Party today because this is about us. I'm going to say us when I say young. <laughs> this is about us and the kind of governance that we want to create. And I know, you know, you will find that this generation, your generation, is less likely to remain stuck on the history of how we got here and more likely to acknowledge it for its lessons and then turn immediately to solutions. So not that we don't have to understand how we got here. We do. How we got here is, is how I got here because I was looking on at a situation that was frankly untenable. And I was looking on at a state of economic management that was appalling. And that is what brought me here. So it's not that we can forget but I think that more and more, we as a Barbados Labour Party will find that young people in particular, including you, are more likely to reflect on the past and acknowledge it for its lessons and then say, what are the solutions? How do we face it? And how do we fix it? And from a political economy perspective, policymakers tell you that, the, the, the economists tell you that is ideally what you want. You want politicians who do that because many politicians are not likely to do that if it is a difficult decision that is going to impact on their capacity to get re-elected. And I am going to come to that shortly. But I do think that having this developed a new charter of Barbados, I do think that a part of that conversation has to be a social compact with each other. To understand or to agree on what is the role of the state, and what is the set of responsibilities that it must fulfill, given the revenue that it collects on the one hand, the tools at its disposal to collect that revenue, and the expenditure commitments that it makes to the people. What do I mean by that? I think it is time for us to have broad agreement on what is it that a government must do, should do, with the revenue that it collects, that, we, that we, it, it collects from people, what should it spend it on? What is the ordering of priorities, given that there is a fixed amount of revenue that it collects? And I think that conversation is important because, and is the reason that I believe in sharing revenue information and sharing expenditure information and saying, listen, this is what I collected 
This is what I have spent in the name of the people of Barbados because you have determined that education up to university level is important to us. That universal health care is important to us. That a road maintenance program, a road maintenance schedule that looks like this is important to us. But if we do these things, there are other things that we cannot do. And so how do we prioritize? We need a social compact that is that detailed. Not to say what every single expenditure is going to be, but to agree to say, listen, I think that the government should do these things and these things I can handle myself as citizens of Barbados. I think it is the time to have that conversation and to understand that there can be no rights without responsibility. That as part of a social compact, we say, government, you are responsible for this. You're responsible for reporting to us on how you've done it. And we also have some responsibilities. Now, in all of the conversation recently, it's been interesting to talk with my fellow Barbadians and to understand where they're coming from. It's been interesting. And it's been interesting to reflect on the fact that a Democratic Labour Party government for 10 years showed us nothing. Showed us nothing. And, and, I, and, I, and I don't say that as a political point. I say that as a researcher who had to try and find information to make arguments and to do work, and it wasn't there. A Democratic Labour Party government showed this country very, very little in the way of information, in the way of evidence, in the way of truth. And then when you discovered any evidence, asked you not to believe what was right in front of your eyes. That was my experience before I came to this work. It was what drove me to this work. This Barbados Labour Party government asks you to believe what is right in front of your eyes. We can't say that we want evidence and explanations and then when we receive them in an objective way, don't accept them. We have to give space, and I remember saying this in a Grantley Adams Memorial Lecture a year, five years ago now, that we have to open our minds for the, for the possibility that people who come to political service are going to do the right thing. And when the right thing happens, we have to accept that it is the right thing. We can't take evidence that we ask for and then not believe what that evidence says. So this Barbados Party government asks you to believe what is right in front of your eyes. And that is why, comrades, I took the position that I took with respect to the Auditor General's report. Because the government has to take the steps necessary to create trust. And I will say to you honestly, that I never wanted to, and never want to be associated with any of the behavior that caused me to come here. I never want to be associated with, with even vaguely with the kinds of habits of a previous administration that did not think it was their responsibility to come and account to the people of Barbados. And it is the reason why I would not have come here to speak with you today if there had been no response laid in Parliament to the Auditor General's report. Because I believe we have to have the courage of our convictions. But now that the response has been laid, what does it tell us? It tells us, for example, that we had an audit of a school meal center under the former Democratic Labour Party administration that was pur proposed to provide meals to 20 schools and was supposed to cater to emergency situations in the event of a national disaster. That was to have been constructed between August 2012 and January 2014 by a firm that was undisclosed. We don't know who got the contract for $19.9 million. By 2016, construction had been halted. And a Barbados Labour Party government then decided that it was important to continue work on the center. But let us get it clear. The Auditor General's report in many ways points out poor economic and financial management of resources from a previous administration that we, 
decided to face and fix. Now, similarly, with respect to the whole issue of Clearwater Bay and the Four Seasons project, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this, but the fact that these actions, a series of actions taken between 2011 and 2016, where an advance given to settle a loan guarantee, mainly in respect of the project, was not properly appropriated, causing the asset or its value to be written off, which is the only accounting opportunity that you really have. Those actions were taken between 2011 and 2016 under a previous Democratic Labour Party administration. What am I saying? I am saying that yes, it is important, and I thank the, the, the leader of, of the Democratic Labour Party for pointing out why it's important for us to get answers on the failings of his party's administration. So what is revealed by the Auditor General's report, in many ways, and in the most glaring ways, point to poor management from a previous DLP administration. It does not give me pleasure or pride to say that. And it does not suggest that the Director of Finance and Economic Affairs was not entirely correct to lay a response before Parliament because a response was necessary. But in the response and in the report itself, we see that what we are talking about is a government today that is facing and fixing several of the mistakes of a previous administration. And we have to be clear on that. Because one does not want to have to keep pointing this out, but this is the evidence. And these are the facts. Now, the report also tells us, though, and the DFA's response also tells us, that even though we now have a Central Bank Amendment Act limiting its borrowing from government, we now have a Public Financial Management Act that has seen the establishment of a fiscal framework and a midterm expenditure review laid in Parliament, that many more systems are yet to be perfected. And I think that it is important that we not step back or run away from that reality. That a lot of the accounting discrepancies that we have seen over the last couple of years, as I have said before, come from the fact that there are systems that need to be improved. But I think we also have to realize that all of this reform cannot, with the best will in the world, cannot happen at once. But that there needs to be a timed plan for these reforms. And there needs to be the maturity of governance in a country like Barbados in 2022 to commit to these reforms even when they overlap or cross new administrations. I remember Democratic Labour Party that wanted to repeal the Public Accounts Committee Act. They wanted to get rid of one of the key institutions we have in this country to account to the people of Barbados. And I, when I talk about a new governance in Barbados in 2022, I'm talking about a maturity of governance that sees us coming together. And just like we did in 2018, agree that there are certain reforms that are not about party, that there are certain reforms that are simply about accountability to the people of Barbados. I don't know how anybody can be in government and not appreciate that they are Bajans first. That if I don't tell the truth, to you or to my constituents is myself that I'm lying to. And this is the kind of maturity that I want us to be able to see. I hope you will let me know how I'm doing because I'm not at all paying attention to time. <laughs> um, and that brings me to the matter of national insurance that I have been I've also been reflecting on a lot. I don't think there's a Barbadian alive today, this afternoon, who has not been thinking about it and discussing it. But I, as I approach the topic, I want to encourage us to remember what I said at the start, the question of political economy. Doing the right thing today versus doing the hard thing, or versus doing the easy thing, sorry. Doing the right thing versus doing the easy thing. 
doing the right thing today versus kicking the can down the road for my children and your children to inherit. I'm bearing in mind that economics tells us and public policy tells us that the ideal government that you want is one that makes a difficult decision even if it may affect its chances to get re-elected. You understand what that is? It seems to me that that is what this Barbados Labour Party government is doing. Making an extremely difficult decision to face a problem and fix it. A problem that has been kicked down the road for decades. But I think that just as we agreed in 2018 that we needed to keep the currency peg, just as we agreed based on a survey to what state owned enterprises we needed to keep and which ones we didn't need, I think that the first step in this conversation has to be for us to agree that we need a national insurance scheme. I think that settling that, agreeing that, and having an honest conversation about what that means has to be the first step. Because I think that we have to realize that this is not just about pensions. National insurance scheme, first of all, if it is optional, if everybody doesn't contribute, it does not work because it means that the base is too narrow and that contributions increase for all of the rest of us. It is not just about pensions, it is about maternity benefits, it is about unemployment, it is about when you get sick. And so I think that the first part of that social compact would be for Barbadians to agree, if this is what we want, that this has to be a part of what the state is responsible for. But then what are the objective facts on national insurance? One is that social insurance models all over the world are broken. The model of social insurance all over the world is broken. It's broken because Barbados is not the only country with increased life expectancy and declining population. It is happening everywhere. The US, Europe, Latin America, and the Caribbean. I've been doing some reviews as in particular of some of these schemes that are closer to home, Brazil, Argentina, and so on. And in those reviews, the economists who reviewed, who, who, who looked at those schemes said, the young people today are supportive of senior citizens, but when these young people are old, there will be no one supportive of them. And that is just the problem. It is everywhere. So that is an objective fact. I don't have to come and tell you that. Anybody can go and read that for themselves. Another objective fact is that the NIS has an average return since it was established in 1967 of 5.8% on its investments. An average return of 5.8% on its investments. Now that is very difficult to get in a sustained way in any market. But I also, if you'll indulge me, also wanted to say a little bit about one of the measures that we use to, to, to look at whether an investment is sound or whether an investment plan is sound. And it's a sharp, a sharp ratio developed by a man called William Sharp. So a sharp ratio looks at the return on investment versus the risk of that investment. I know many in this room know what I'm talking about more than me because. But less than one is considered bad. One to 1 1.9 is considered adequate or good and from 2 to 2.99 is considered very good. Greater than 3 is considered excellent. So that the higher a fund's sharp ratio, the better its returns have been rel relative to the amount of risk taken. Now, the, the, the amount of risk taken is important because you can get high returns, but I'm not sure that the people of Barbados want this high level of speculation and risk taking with respect to their resources. And so the NIS has had a sharp ratio of 2.06, which is in the category of very good, which means that the return has, on investments made has been very good compared to the risk of those investments. The problem that the NIS has today, and, I, and it is sometimes difficult to separate the roles that people play, but I say this as an economist who has been looking at this pension question. The problem that the NIS has today is not an investment problem. 
the returns on NAS investment have been high and the rate of return versus the risk of the investments is sound. The problem that the NAS has today is the problem that every social insurance scheme that is set up in this way has all over the world, which is that we have increased life expectancy and a declining population. In 2003, pension reform was undertaken in Barbados. In 2012, 2014, 2016, report after report cautioned Barbados that steps needed to be taken urgently to be able to maintain and to strengthen the sustainability of the fund and of the scheme. This is not a 2018 problem. It is not a 2022 problem. It is a 2022 solution that this Barbados Liberal Party government has decided to face and to fix and to take. And I want us to understand when we get the government that we have been asking for. Be careful what you wish for, because if you want a government that is gonna take difficult decisions, even if it means, it may not be reelected, Corey and David, they're looking at you. Even if it means it may not be reelected. But that is the government that every country in the world prays to have. But I want to turn quickly then, because I know that once what I've just said gets out, even though these are objective facts, there is going to be a response. But let's turn then to the solutions. In my estimation, the first solution is compliance. It has to be a compliance first approach to the national insurance scheme. And when I talk compliance, I think that we know that there are large companies and companies that do well that either collect national insurance contributions and don't pay them in or don't collect them. And I think that we have to start there with this compliance issue. I also think that the NIS has to create value, has to create value and increase efficiency in the speed of benefit payments, access to clients' own information, and it has to stay current on audits. And this is a whole part of the question of building trust. But I don't think that we can look at NIS reform if we're not talking about a scheme that creates and increases value the value that all of us get. And looking around the region, you know, there are countries in Eastern Caribbean that pay out benefits in 48 hours. Our national insurance scheme has to get there because I do not think that we can propose to the people of Barbados some of these reforms that are on the table if we do not also show how we are increasing efficiency, cutting the time of benefit payments. People need benefits today. That is why they are there. And I think the NIS has to commit to improving these times and to creating value for people if we are to take forward these reforms. Because you can't ask people to sacrifice more for nothing or for the same suboptimal value that they're getting today. Importantly, I feel very strongly about this one, and it was clear to us during COVID that the NIS has to align firm the benefits that people get who are employed by firms and the benefits that self-employed people get. They have to be aligned. They have to be the same. And we saw this during COVID. We created, when I was a part of the government before, a, a self-employed benefit that allowed self-employed people during COVID who would ordinarily not have qualified to be able to get a benefit. And I dare say that that saved a lot of families and that helped people to be able to keep their head above water in circumstances where they didn't know how they were going to. And the lesson that we learned from that was that that self-employment benefit had to remain. We couldn't get rid of it after COVID because we saw that it was important. And I think that if we are going to, to have a reform of the NIS system, there has to be perfect alignment between 
what we would call a standard employee benefit and self-employed benefits. There also has to be flexibility in the timing of how the self-employed are able to make their contributions. And when I say, we say self-employed, you know, a lot of the time we think that we are talking about a certain category. There's, there are lawyers and economists and accountants and other professional categories that are self-employed. And one of the things that those of us who are self-employed know, I say those of us because you're all self-employed here, yeah? Corey and um, <laughs> Davidson, but those of us who are self-employed know that we can't always predict when we will make income. So there has to be flexibility in allowing contributions to be paid in a way that does not, complete, does not destabilize the certainty of the fund itself or the scheme itself, but then allows people to have that flexibility based on how they receive income. Even though the problems with the NIS are, are not as a result of poor investment, I do believe that we have to look at the investment policy. Because what I actually think is happening is that we're missing an opportunity for higher returns um, because the investments that we currently have are concentrated in perhaps not the highest bearing um, kinds of investments, interest bearing kinds of investments. And I think that when we start to look at those reforms, having an investment policy that has controls, yes, that has high levels of comfortability, yes, but also is able to be more varied. That that is something that I would encourage the government to consider. What I'm about to say may lose me some friends, but that's all right. I think we have to look at a more progressive national insurance scheme. What that means is higher levels of com contributions from the wealthy with no increase in benefit. I'm gonna repeat that. <laughs> Higher levels of contributions from the wealthy, and I use the word wealthy, it's not a word that economists like to use. Um, we like to talk about income cohort and all that kind of thing. But I use the word wealthy because I think that we have to be very careful about the, what we would normally call the tax incidence on the middle class. So I think we have to be very careful about, welcome comrade Kerry. I think we have to be very careful about this notion of which category in Barbados can bear more. And I think that the world over, increasingly, we are realizing that we have to talk about the wealthy. Because when we set these thresholds for higher contributions too low, then we have an issue with a middle class that is vulnerable and that is about to become poor. And I'm going to get to that in two minutes at the end of my presentation. But yes, higher levels of contributions from the wealthy and how we define wealthy is going to be important uh, with no increase in benefit. And I have said it three times now because I stand by it. I stand by it. I don't know if it is a, if it is a recommendation that the government will take, but I think that the NIS scheme contribution system has to start to more closely align with our progressive tax system. If this makes sense to me. Uh, and so I am interested to hear what the responses <laughs> will be like. I've also been looking at the idea of the disability benefit for those who are declared medically unfit to work. And the fact that in many cases, I shouldn't say many cases, because this is anecdotal evidence that I have, but it seems to me that there are cases where people are able to do other kinds of work and that they in fact can continue to contribute and to work just not in the kind of work or the field from which they were uh, medically retired. Uh, and this is important to me in particular because there are others I feel with disabilities that mean they can never work. And those people and their carers who need additional support are left out. So I think that there's some right sizing to be done there, even in terms of the definitions of disability in the, in the national insurance scheme. I have a young uh, constituent who lives with autism and is told, I mean, he's only now come of age, but I've known him all along as a, as a minor, and who was told, 
disability benefit would have to be, you would have to be blind or deaf. But having autism, and please correct me if I'm using the wrong um, terminology, but having low functioning autism, which means that he cannot work, does not qualify him or his carer for that benefit. So I think that we have to, and this is anecdotal evidence, I'm not speaking to what is an official policy of the NAS, but I can speak with authority to what this family has been told. So I think there has to be some right sizing. Those who are, who are medically, retired medically unfit from a particular field can still contribute in others. And those who currently do not um, access a disability benefit, but really cannot work, them and their carers and their family, I think that we have to look at um, making sure that they're caught in the net. Now, the question of the retirement age, I'm not calling any numbers at all. Um, but I think that there are two things that we have to look at. One is to acknowledge that staying in the workforce for longer has an effect on our health and our capacity to continue to be productive. And we can't have a conversation about staying in the workforce for longer without a conversation about health care, health care financing, and also the idea of, of what we call health compliance rewards. When I say health compliance rewards, I mean if people are taking care of themselves and exercising and eating well and following the treatment protocol that they have been given by the polyclinic, then there should be some reward, um, some, some financial reward, some benefit that they get so that we don't, so that we don't have to then have that finan financial expenditure on the other side in terms of treatment because it will always be more. And, and many of us experience that. You know, we've lived in other places. We have an insurance policy. Um, we sign up for the gym and immediately the premium falls. I think this kind of approach to rewarding responsible behavior is also gonna mean that we have a higher capacity to take care of people if it is that they have to work longer. I also think the question of healthcare financing is important. Um, that is a conversation for another time, but I, I am aware that, um, that the government is looking very seriously again at being able to understand and structure healthcare financing well. But to me, that is also part of the social compact conversation. What is it in the way of healthcare that we believe we can reasonably expect? And what is our own responsibility in that compact to, to, to take care of ourselves um, and to be able to take ownership of our own health? And finally, in terms of the considerations in the, in the NAS solutions, the question of work interruption between the ages of 55 and 65 bothers me. I meet a lot of people who have left their previous employment at these ages. So we're talking now about a prolonged working age. But if I leave, if I'm working, sorry for calling names, but this is what comes to me. If I'm working at Purity, and should, probably shouldn't have used Purity talking about um, health and but if I'm working at Purity and I leave at 55, no, I'm still in prime working age according to any new characterization. What is the potential, being real and practical, of being employed by a new company at the age of 55, 60, 62? We really have to consider that seriously. Because it's one thing to assume that a person is going to stay at purity from 25 to 70. But that doesn't happen. I mean, most of you in here will probably stay, and I'm, this is based on evidence that we have in terms of the new workforce. Most people now stay on average three to five years in a job. I see all y'all all, all, all like, yeah, I left that when I was sick of that. I had to go on. Um, <laughs> but but, but that, cha that has changed. The length of time that people stay with an institution changes. And so we have to account for the fact that people will now be looking for employment at what would previously be considered an advanced age. 
And how do we make way for that? How do we structure our economy to be able to, to let employers know that it's okay to employ somebody at 60 if they're going to be working for another decade? So these are some of the considerations that I think um, have to be borne in mind when we talk about a restructured NIS as part of that social compact that we agree that this is something that matters to us. Um, in all of this, as I close, there's something that we have to keep central about the socioeconomic reality of Barbados, and I alluded to it earlier. Now, I think that our approach to social protection has been one where we look at protecting the most vulnerable, and I think that is important. But I think we have to consider what vulnerable is. I say all the time that poverty or the state of being poor is not permanent. It's something that can happen to either any of us today or tomorrow. And we have increasingly, and Barbados um, sociologically is known for it, this idea of a very large middle class. Um, and more and more, I feel that we should just get rid of those categorizations altogether. Um, because even that is, is, is transient, right? But I think that we've set up a system where we have this notion that the vulnerable is a kind of a static group of people that you are going to put you in that vulnerable box and that's where you stay. And there's a group there, there is a group of people like those with disabilities who, who can never work and so on. But this notion that there is a group with a capital T, capital V called the vulnerable, and that number never changes, that is a mistake. And we can't set policy in that way. We have to set policy according to a person's life cycle. What are the vulnerabilities that I may, might experience during my life cycle, right? Um, I may have a significant illness in my family. How does that affect my income? How does that affect my, my capacity to spend on the things that matter to my family? Um, I may lose my job at some point. So I may not qualify according to your poverty line as poor. But there are some points in my life where I may need the support of the state. And so one other recommendation that I would make to the government, not just with respect to these issues of financial management, but in general, is that we also have to understand that when we talk about this middle class, that increasingly we are talking about people who have complex vulnerabilities and that our policy has to be very fluid and very nimble. It is not just a question of taking care of a set number of families because tomorrow that number could change. It could go up, it could go down. And it has to be about creating the kinds of policies throughout a person's life cycle that anticipate the kinds of difficulties that I may have. You know, this idea that you look at a person and you say, oh, Shanika got a, a YSL bag, but she didn't want no welfare. <laughs> now, I'm not, saying, I'm not saying that the means testing approach is wrong altogether, but I'm saying that these kinds of discrete approaches are not always what societies, developing, evolving societies like Barbados could most benefit from. So comrades, as I close, I really think that this is an exciting time in Barbados. I know that for some people, it, it, for many people, it feels treacherous. Uh, I know that it feels insecure. I think that I am satisfied that this is a government that listens and pays attention to expressions of vulnerability and insecurity and responds quickly. I don't think that it is possible to get everything right all the time, but I think that it is important to be listening and to be in a place to respond. And I'm satisfied that this Barbados Labour Party government has done and is doing that. But where I think that you all are more and more and more important in these conversations is that I think that this has to be the time for a new 
governance, that we have to be honest with ourselves, that we have to sometimes resist the temptation to just be clever and to just get likes and to just seem as if, you know, we, we have all the answers and that we have to commit to getting constructively involved in the conversation. We have to commit to looking at the facts and not just rolling our eyes and saying, well, your numbers might say this, but this is what I want to believe. That does not serve us. I commit that wherever I see a policy that is suggested that I believe, based on what I think I can con contribute, is not in the, does not serve the people of Barbados, that I will always say that. But I think that as part of our new social compacts, as part of our new governance, we all have to commit to a certain level of honesty with each other. That when we see something that suggests that the government is doing the right thing, that we acknowledge that. When we see that the government has no choice but to act on a matter, as is the case with NAS, a, a government could receive a 17th actuary review, lay in parliament, and slide on down the road, and leave it for somebody else to solve, because previous governments have done that. And this Barbados Labour Party government has chosen to face it and fix it. I encourage all Barbadians to join us in the conversation. Comrades, thank you. All right, before you um, escape, uh, Marcia, um, do we have any questions for Marcia before we move on? Stan. Wait, and Jesse Mike as well. Evening, everyone. So I've been watching the news a lot. As an IR student, we have to keep up with the news. So I've seen that in America, they've reported their second quarter economic downturn. Bank of England, they're saying that they want to raise the interest rates in order to help with inflation. How do you see Barbados, well, our economy, that's heavily dependent on tourism, trying to navigate those waters and trying to run the parallels along with COVID and all the other issues that we have coming along? Oh, that's just that small matter. Um, <laughs> small matter. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I think, as you know, we don't um, manipulate monetary policy with a pegged interest rate, right? So the central bank um, is not going to be manipulating interest rates, but we are takers of those rates. And so some of you may have seen from your banks uh, that they're saying, okay, well, some of, your, some of our products, some of the contracts that you're in, your mortgage and so on, may be affected by those rate increases. Um, I think the question of how do, you, do I see us navigating those waters? I mean, I think that in a country the size of Barbados, we've already begun, right? Uh, I think the cap on, on the cost of fuel is one of the measures that is meant to address that. I think the compact with the social partnership that has agreed to a basket of goods that will not increase uh, has started to address that. So I think that you'll find in small economies like this, governments um, will and should take some very targeted measures to be able to get us through the rough time. It is always a mistake to, take a permanent, to make a permanent policy change in response to a temporary issue, right? That is always a mistake. Um, and so I think that the kinds of, so for example, completely changing the tax regime, um, as some have, have suggested, in order to address uh, transient or transitory changes in prices, I have never um, been a proponent of that because you, the problem is gonna pass and then you're gonna be left with a system that does not work for your economic structure. Uh, so, you know, it is, a lar it, is, it is an existential question that you've posed. Um, because I also think, and, and I think when Kerry comes to address you, he'll talk a bit about that. But I also think that the question of diversification of the economy um, and the fact that we're so heavily reliant on tourism has to do with a lot of structural issues as well, right? So it's not just a question of picking winning sectors. It's a question of making it easier to do business. Um, uh, it's a question of having 
what we would call feeding sectors like the one that carries responsible for. So energy um, and the cost of energy and the availability of energy affects everything. So I think that being able to make that more affordable and get more people enfranchised in that sector is one of the ways to do that. But I, again, I'm satisfied that this government is doing all it can. I remember this is an equation, revenue in and expenditure out. So it may not be everything, but all that it can to try and address some of these short-term cost of living issues. The structural growth issues, that's, a, that's, that's another meeting. Um, I think there's a lot to, to be said there, but I think the energy sector that Kerry's leading uh, is, is doing a lot to go in that direction. And otherwise you can see me after the hour. <laughs> yes. All right, anyone else?